first of all, Admiral Farragut was a nice, normal person. Second of all, his kid stepbrother had an ego larger than the Earth's atmosphere. <laughs> Some of my students annually ask me questions like, why did the South lose the Civil War? <clears throat> and I tell them that it was due to a total lack of air superiority. <laughs> and some of them actually think they were in so, Anyway, let's talk about the Brownwater Navy following along behind what Tim Smith had done this, has done this morning. And I want to show you the vessels and show you the variety of vessels that are um, profuse. You know, the average, and it's getting worse across the country, uh, the average student comes out of elementary or middle school thinking that there were only two vessels in the entire Civil War. The Virginia and that other one. <laughs> in the Deep South, they can remember Virginia, but they go, what? what? Is that a lizard? All right, let's do it. Um, the image that you see is of Admiral Farragut's uh, West Coast blockading squadron uh, passing the forts below New Orleans. Now, a lot of folks who've never been down there, uh, just reading about it, you think that these forts are on the coast. No, they're 70 miles upstream. Because if you put them on the coast, well, they would sink like a ton of bricks. And there were several tons of bricks. So they didn't do it. About 30 miles south of New Orleans. And Admiral Farragut had a hard time coming up because uh, there is a, a, a point at which the Mississippi River divides into five mouths. And it, it, it looks like this. There's a bowl, and then there's these five channels. And he didn't have enough vessels to plug them all. So the main, the main channel is called Southwest Pass. And so he sends uh, three of his sloops that we've talked about today uh, up there, and nothing happened. And the Confederates didn't care if they were there or not. So, frankly, the crews, particularly of the Brooklyn and the Richmond, got bored. And they started relaxing and enjoying the hot weather. And then the Confederates sent down fire rafts and they panicked. And the captain of the Brooklyn, sad ship the Brooklyn, uh, ordered abandoned ship. Everybody gets off the vessel. The fire rafts, having no propulsion and no way to figure out where they're going, passed. And so he immediately ordered a recall. He was fired. <laughs> Technology, what a concept. Still there. I'm doing something wrong. Technology. Okay. It ought to, it's not real. Now I don't know. Yeah, I have Earlier, I swear it was the other one. Um, this is the Hartford. And you can see that she's an elevator. And she's a steam-powered screw vessel. Notice that if you look at her rudder, you can also see the propeller. It could be raised inside of the hull, and it could go as a sailing ship. Now, you never see smoke coming out of the chimney and the sails up. One reason. The soot coming out has inversely burned up the sails. So you got to think about what you're doing. The Hartford made it all the way up to Vicksburg once. Uh, 
took New Orleans with the fleet, took uh, Baton Rouge, uh, made Pittsburgh or uh, made Natchez, Mississippi surrender twice because they were afraid that they would lose their beautiful homes. So they immediately surrendered to the Navy, and then when they landed army forces, they surrendered to the army. And those houses are still there. This is an inland boat. This is the timber clad uh, Tyler. There are three of them, as Tim said this morning. Uh, there's uh, the Tyler, the Lexington, and the Conestoga. Uh, they are not exactly the same. Look where the chimneys are. Chimneys are the smokestacks. Midship on the Tyler. Forward on the Lexington. Uh, made out of wood, laminate. Uh, in some places, uh, over five feet thick. You could, you could certainly turn back a mini ball. You could also turn back uh, a 12 pound uh, howitzer or, or even a rifled uh, field gun as well. But nothing, nothing from a large fort or from, from an ironclad. They were side wheelers. They had rounded sterns. Uh, they could be used as a round once. <laughs> they were painted black and they scared the absolute hell out of Confederate soldiers a month before the Battle of Shiloh. That's another story. These are true rounds. There is a, a unit that you may be aware of called the Mississippi Marine Brigade. Anybody ever heard of it? Uh, they did serve on the Mississippi. They were not part of the Army. They were not part of the Navy. They were not part of the Marines. They were a separate group that was commissioned by President Lincoln to his buddy Alfred Ellett. And there's more Ellets in the war almost than Joneses or Smiths. They're all the same family. And General Ellett, he was made a general, he never, never had a day of military training, but he knew what he wanted to do. And he was a very, very brilliant man. He says, I'm going to develop something that has never been seen on the American waters. I'm going to, I'm going to create a ram that is reusable, and it's going to be fast, and it's going to be so devastating that we don't need guns. <laughs> Give it two months, they put guns on them. But they were devastating rams. You can always tell a, a naval or, or an elite ram for one thing. You look up between the stacks and there's a letter. M is monarch, Q is queen of the west, L is lioness, and there's several others. This is a, a, a photograph of all of them. Yes, those are cotton bales up front. The, uh, Above the keel in these, there was a timber. It was the center of a very large tree that went all the way to the stern. And it was bolted sideways and vertically, uh, attached to the bow, which was not iron. And then there was 12 to 24 feet of solid wood laminate. You point it in the right direction, and it will go. It was like a dragster. And boy, did they hate it when the Confederates captured a couple of them. This is the Ram Switzerland. Uh, and I got to tell you, this is the only view of it, and I hate this because it looks like there's something wrong with it. It's off center. Something's going wrong. If you looked at it directly from above, the the decks start like a, an arrowhead and then go back. And so they were rounded, laminated wood. This was blown up by the Confederates by plunging shots at Mexico. This is the Queen of the West. The USS Queen of the West. Then the CSS Queen of the West. And then sort of disappeared. We think we know where it is, but nobody's been able to find it. Uh, I've, I've been
been on a team of researchers that we know, we know roughly it's in Grand Lake, Louisiana on the Atchafalaya River. This is how good the rams were. This is at Memphis. And he is pushing a Confederate ram, or she, I think, is pushing a Confederate ram right up on the bank. The Confederate ram then had absolutely no chance to defend itself. And they just left it there. Then the Yankees took we refer to Yankees, you know, Northern troops as Yankees. It's okay. We call others ribs. Uh, when the Union Army came in, they just captured it. It was worthless. It had been broken in the middle, and so they used it for firewood. Now, I'm not going to read slides. I hate people that read slides. As a professor, it just really bothers me. But the main thing I want you to carry away from this is that these inland vessels, north and south, had the capacity for carrying huge ordnance. A 100-pound uh, parrot rifle is, a, is an awful thing if you're looking at the pointy end of the gun. And it was very common for these large weapons to be interchange depending on what the missions were. We don't think about that. You know, didn't they just load guns on the boat and say, well, that's it to the end of the war? No. They could pull them in, take them out. Very arduous. But it depended on the mission. When Admiral Porter comes up the Red River in 1864, his Eastport, we'll see a picture of it, had two 100-pounder parrots in the forward guns. No revolving turrets because he had heard that there were as many as five CSS Arkansas or CSS Tennessees at Shreveport. There was only one that was called Missouri. It was not really finished. This is Baby Brother. This is David Glasgow Parrot. Or uh, David uh, Dixon Porter, who was David Glasgow Parrot's foster brother. Um, there were a lot of porters. There was one Army General, Fitz. And then there was this handsome fellow who's, he's been very good to me. I really like that before. But you, you can't believe what he says. You just have to sort of grin and find a secondary source. And then there was the captain of the Essex who was Dirty Bill. Now Dirty Bill was a full brother of David Dixon Porter, foster brother of Admiral Farragut. Um, he wasn't that good. He, he, was, he was sort of a filthy guy. He never cleaned his beard. And there was always chewing tobacco going down, food from two or three days ago, occasionally a burn. So he comes by the name the Dirty Bill very easily. So what kind of boats are we talking about? This is uh, one of my favorite images. It, it has been in several publications. It has been misnamed in several publications. This is at uh, Cairo, Illinois, the southernmost northern naval base at the pointy tip end of Illinois. Not on the Mississippi River, but the, ship, the mouth of the Ohio, facing upstream because they're anchored. They're not steaming, but the currents pull them around. Now, how do I know that that's at Cairo, Illinois? Uh, those wharf boats existed until the 1930s. And we have photographs of other boats right there. And my wife and I went there. And I said, look, well, that's where they were. And she said, how do you know? I said, because you can see the new boats where the old boats were. They were the atom bombs of their age, the poop turtles, the river or city class iron plants. Here's the USS Cairo, the only one to remain intact and above ground. Um, it's at Vicksburg National Military Park. How many of you have seen it? All right. I did something you didn't do. When I was writing my book, uh, I mapped 
a lot of the national military parks were national park zones, and Vicksburg was one of them. And so when I was working on my book, they let me under it. And so I got to really see where the, the torpedo hit, and you can see how much damage it did in moving the wood apart. But they really were the atomic bombs in their age. They did have some problems in that their draft was five to seven feet and fully loaded with ammo and, and uh, coal. Uh, they could go up to eight and a half to nine feet, which precluded them from operating in small rivers. This is Lieutenant Commander at the time, Thomas O. Selfridge, who ends up as a Rear Admiral. He was one of Admiral Porter's favorites. And Selfridge, Selfridge is just, um, nobody's like him. This is him when he's Commander of uh, the Cairo. He is 28 years old. Most of the lieutenant commanders and commanders that were vessel captains were between 27 and 32 years old. And uh, he's got a fine set of mutton chops, doesn't he? Well, he had seen a lot of action, as you can see on the slide. In 1862, he was the officer of the deck aboard the Cumberland when the Virginia steamed out and sank it. And it was Selfridge who saved every man on that vessel. He got them off, no loss of life, none. So then they decided, okay, he's brave. Let's put him in with flag officer foot. And he gets into the Cairo where he's part of the Yazoo City Expedition and um, hit a mine, hit a torpedo, and sank in nine minutes. The reason we have the Cairo is that she sank in the perfect medium to, pre to preserve a vessel, and that is R Mississippi River mud. If you, and, and those of you who have been to the Cairo know what I'm talking about. At the museum, you'll see officer shoes that still have the shine on them. You'll see medicine bottles that the wax is still integral. The contents are still there. It's, it's an amazing time capsule. When the Cairo went down, uh, the Army tried to figure out what to do with him. The Navy tried to figure out what to do with him. And he said, I can't get out. I'm sort of trapped here. And so they let him be the commander of a land army artillery battle. And above the Cairo, you can see his very nice bronze bust with that gigantic set of mutton chops at Battery Selfridge. And that's where the Navy Monument is. So he gets another command. They put him in charge of the third of the tin clad, not tin clad, wooden clad ships, the Conestoga. And he is the ultimate, ultimate officer. He knows what he's doing. He saves his men. He's great for his men. He's steaming up river at night with the lights on. And a recently captured Confederate tin clad, and we'll talk about tin clads in a minute, uh, Ramden. He went down again in less than 20 minutes. Gets all of his men off of it. He's an amazing commander. Well, Gideon Wells, the Secretary of the Navy, started seeing a pattern here. <laughs> and he wanted to cashier him. He wanted to dump him out of the Navy because he was pretty hard on the federal budget. And Admiral Porter wrote, David Dixon Porter, wrote an absolutely wonderful letter to Gideon Wells. And he is saying, we need more men like young Selfridge. He's fearless. He protects his men. Notice that in, and this is the way you put it, in the three unfortunate incidents in which vessels were lost, uh, Selfridge saved all of the crew. And it, and it changed Gideon Wells' heart. 
So Gideon Wells writes back to Porter, and he says, you were very eloquent in your defense of young Mr. Selfridge, lieutenant commander. We'll keep him in the name. But for God's sake, do not give him a command beginning with the letter C. <laughs> And so Selfridge was given command of the monitor Osage, which survived the war. And Selfridge went on to take, later on began to uh, or earn Porter's place within the Navy, and he retired when we were at. Fun guy. Selfridge says no more. This is the bit. Another view of what Tim had this morning. Uh, there's a guy that we really haven't talked about. We talked about Erickson, who was absolutely terrific, knew what he was doing, innovative man, but there was another one who was an equal, in my view, to John Erickson, and that is James Buchanan Eves from St. Louis. And Eads is a self-made man. He is an engineer. If you've been to St. Louis, and if you've driven over the great Mississippi Bridge called the Eads Bridge, he built it. He did not have one year of college. He did not have one day of college. Before the war, he was a natural-born engineer. He's ranked among the three top engineers, and I've put him right up above the other two as a 19th century American engineers. Uh, Eads learned about the Mississippi River uh, as a kid, much like what you heard about midshipmen, uh, as a young midshipman. And he became a steamboat pilot. He became what's called a steamboat constructor. Today we would say an architect, a marine architect. And his specialty was working for insurance companies prior to the war. <coughs> Uh, getting goods back from sunken steamboats. And how did he do it? Well, he invented ships based on another man's idea, Henry Miller Shreve, who uh, in our neck of the woods is pretty famous. He had 22 patents. Uh, Shreve could not get along with God. God could not get along with Henry Shreve. Uh, he was uh, the chief officer of the Corps of Engineers west of the Alleghenies. He wrote reports to himself saying how good he was. He was so mean that when he died, the United States government decided to release the funds from his patents and gave it to his widow. He can use these patents and he creates, as Shreve had done, catamarans this vessel, the Benton, from the bow, and the poop turtles from the bow is a normal looking steamboat, but in the back, there are two modified hulls. In all of his vessels, there are no side wheels. There are stern wheels, but they're not at the stern. They're up toward about a third of the way, up. And you can see this rounded top on the left uh, that uh, is the armor encasement for the wheels. Uh, notice that, according to naval tradition, it's a sloop. It has three whole masts, aft most being the mizzen mast. If you hooked up sails to them, that thing would sit as still as the New Jersey. But the Navy required masts. So he said, okay, and I'm going to show you what the brown water sailors did with them. The Benton was an ex-snag boat. In those days, they called snag boats submarines. It's twice as wide and a third longer than the poop turtles. It has five guns, port and starboard. And instead of three, four across the front. This will be Admiral Porter's flagship when he wants to use it. It will also be at Vicksburg, General Sherman's flag boat. Generals have flag boats. As soon as they leave, it becomes a flagship. 
So kill that for your next trivia for us. This is the East Port. She is the largest vessel in the Mississippi Squadron. This is the one that Tim talked about. Uh, that was taken in Eastport, Kentucky. It was designed to be an ironclad by the rebels. However, uh, they only got her hull up and they had some armor on it. Um, the Union constructors did not like what they saw and so they took it back to the waterline and they built this. Two 100 pounder parrot rifles on the front. Four gun ports on either side, two in the rear. It is a side wheeler, but notice that the wheels have been armored and taken very far to the rear. If you want to get an idea of the size, it's easy. Go to any high school or college or football field, and you know that it's 100 yards. And 100 yards is 300 feet. This was 290 feet long. From wheelhouse to wheelhouse, the broadest part of the beam, it was in excess of 55 feet. Uh, the armor in front of the wheels and at the, uh, on the very front and the oblique front on either side was six inches thick. And almost any ordinance of the day would bounce off of it. But like all of the ironclads from the Union, she had a wooden bottom. She had a wooden hull. And the greatest dangers to ironclads were either plunging shells, like you find at Fort Donaldson, really harming flag officer uh, Foote's uh, attack. By the way, Tim didn't say something I think is always fun. Well, not for the guy, but uh, Flag Officer Foote was leading at Fort Donaldson, and they had some, the Confederates had some really big ordnance. They had a 108-pound uh, cannon that was not really a howitzer, but they could fire it like it, and it worked great until it blew up. But before it blew up, it launched a very fine mortar-like trajectory <laughs> shell, and it hit in front of where he was, and splinters came up, metal and wood, and even though they had lost a lot of velocity, one of them goes right down and hits flag officer foot in the foot. That is karma, I don't care what you say. Uh, and he, that was his last action. He ended up hoping to come back, but he had to go to the Washington Navy Yard. And then they found out he had Bright's disease, and that's what killed him. Uh, the East Port, this is on the Red River. It, there, were, there was a, a New Orleans photography company named McPherson and Oliver, who Admiral Porter really liked. And so he asked them to come with him on all of his exploits, and that's why we have photographs and not just drawings. This is at Alexandria on the Red River, um, taken from the east side. See that mud flat? The Confederates had a little surprise uh, for Admiral Porter. He never knew what happened to the day he died, but this is a few days before the East Port was scuttled. Now, fun stuff, okay? Historians just love minutia. It just is what drives us. It's like air. Look at the nearest stern wheel. And you'll see a guy standing looking with a naval telescope at something. See it? Left side. Look at the right side and you'll see a woman in a big dress standing on the left. What's he looking at? He's not looking at the vessel. He's not looking. He's looking at her. Caught him. This is the Choctaw. There were two vessels. You can't. You can't say anything about Union engineers, naval constructors. Uh, that is derogatory, uh, unless it's a bad naval design. Now there were a few of them. This is one. The Choctaw. 
James Buchanan Eads has taken up most of the sheet iron that was being used out of the Chicago mills and the St. Louis mills. And they can't make enough sheet, sheet iron. And so some bright naval engineer whose name is fortunately for his family lost in the records, says, you know, we don't have a lot of sheet iron, but you know what we've got a whole lot of? Indio rubber. Wouldn't it be a great idea if we could just coat these really big gunboats with about three inches of Indio rubber? in sheets. And everybody else around him thought, well, I didn't come up with that. Oh, that sounds good. Let's do it. So they built the, uh, the Choctaw and the Lafayette. We'll see the Lafayette in a minute. Very powerful. So here you are. You're in Missouri. It's pretty cool. And you can put on sheets of any your rubber without any problem. And they use deck stakes to hold the rubber on. Here's her semi-sister, the Lafayette. Notice she's got a rounded front. These are devastating weapons. I mean, they can carry the largest ordnance you can carry outside of 400 pounders, which nobody ever tried to put on a boat. And they sent them south. And you know what happened? It got hot. And that India rubber started cracking because it's not synthetic, it's pure. Well, they tried to swap on basically rubber cement and they filled the cracks. And then they thought, okay, we got to test it to see because nobody had ever tested to see what happened. So they brought a tin clad up to the Choctaw. And at point blank range, less than the width of the boat, it fired right into the Choctaw's rubber, and it bounced straight back and almost sank the tin plate. <laughs> so Admiral Farragut's idea of protection, not so much when you have this kind of problem. So they said, okay, okay, let's send them back up to St. Louis to Crondelay and let's have the rubber taken off. Let's put on sheet iron. We've got more sheet iron. They said, yes, we'll do that. So they put it up there. The stakes are deck stakes. They're about that long. And they wouldn't come out. So dock workers said, not a problem. We will just put the iron over the rubber. And I can just see a bunch of guys in a room with you. What my idea? That's fine. You know, let's do it. So they did it. They sent it back south. Rubber rotted, disappeared. And every time they moved around a bend in the Mississippi, they went chick, chick, and everybody hated them. But they were deadly. They were deadly. So you've got these behemoths, these ironclads. And when the Mississippi River basically was close to being taken care of, mollified, there needed to be a new class of vessel. And Admiral Porter said, I want something to turn around mini balls, maybe some light artillery ordnance. And so they came up with something called tin clad. Oh, they were not coated in tin. This is a, a tin clad monitor, which is uh, Eads' greatest mistake. The idea behind the light draft, shallow channel running vessels is that they could run at about three to four feet of water as opposed to anywhere around nine to ten for the ironclads. And this is the Ozark. It was presented to Admiral Porter, and he looked at it, and he proclaimed immediately, she is a miserable vessel. He told Commander, uh, two commanders, Selfridge and Phelps, that you heard about this morning, Seth Lager Phelps, see if you can put her between you and the rebels. And maybe the rebels will sink her and we will be done with her. 
Now that's a, that's a horrible thing to say about a United States Navy vessel. What was he thinking? Look at the bow, and there's a very fine single gun. Look at the stern, and there's a very fine single gun. And in, in front of the stacks, you'll see this sort of round thing with a small hut on top of it. Well, that's a rotating monitor. It was better than Ericsson's monitor. It weighed less, and it had very little recoil. And he was so happy with it when he built it. The only problem is, is that the flying pilot house, the thing on top of the turret, was bolted onto it. And so there was a, a, a blow tube where he could, you know, tell him, move forward, you know, 10 degrees, whatever. Well, you're like this, and all of a sudden, you're like this. You're like this. You're like this. What? The rebels thought it was hilarious. <laughs> and I think the rebels did everything they could to make sure that they were not going to sink it because it was just too much fun. <laughs> I really do. That miserable vessel. So each comes up with two monitors, only two of their type, built in and around St. Louis, uh, Osage and uh, the Neosha, and they are near sisters. Now look where the turret is. The turret alone weighs 78 tons. Unlike the turrets on this vessel, which go down five stories, this goes down to a hull that is only about three feet below the waterline. Now think about that. It has a ram on the front. They were never used as a ram. It, they were stern wheelers, so the big uh, armored uh, steering structure at the, at the rear is really where the mass is. They had to put the turret so far forward because the armored uh, area uh, and sheeting around the stern had to be balanced. And then Dean says, you know, Erickson's got this problem with this freeboard issue. Well, these are never going to be in waves. But he took care of the freeboard issue. Notice, if you look very closely, the deck slopes. And it gives them about three feet of storage area. And that's why, also, where the crew lived. Unless they were not in danger, then they would live on the decks, like most of the ironclads. Uh, you see those rails? Those are for uh, either putting up tents for sun protection or for sleeping. The Osage will be a very, very uh, famous vessel. This is the you know, well, yeah, this is the Osage. It, it's the one that on the Red River uh, will um, participate in perhaps the strangest battle in the Civil War. Uh, one ironclad monitor against 2,500 Texas cavalry. It was a draw. Uh, seven people on the Confederate side died, unfortunately for them. Uh, one of them was their commander, General Tom Green, who was noted for, for really wanting to take on the ships. You know, right up to that last one. <laughs> Selfridge was the captain. Selfridge was in the turret, and the day before, his best friend, his number two, had gone out on the deck, and a, what they call sharpshooters, we would call snipers, killed him. And so he's talking to the boat's engineer, and he says, you know, Captain, I think I can rig up a pipe, put two mirrors in it, opposite 45 degrees angle, 45 degree uh, angle, and you could you could actually aim the gun from the inside. He invented the periscope. And Selfridge fired the first shot in over with a periscope and killed Tom Green. Now, Tom Green was on top of a horse, urging his men on. Selfridge fired high because they didn't know how to aim with a periscope. And it was a canister round, and one of the canister 
balls, took off a third of Tom Green's head and was dead before he hit the ground. And uh, Selfridge could see it. He remarked on it. And the Confederates just quit fighting. Uh, they saw that their, their beloved commander was dead and they, they found the part of his skull that was missing. They put it back. He didn't know he was dead. They wrapped him up into blankets and then they took him directly back to Austin and he's buried in a very high place of honor. Tom Green County's name for him. Texas. Here's her sister on the Red River. This is in the Neosho. The only way you can tell the difference between the two is, is look at the engine house at the rear and you'll see a hatch. And somebody thought it would be a good idea to put a 12-pound a, a howitzer in the engine room. <laughs> yeah, that's my thought too. And they could only use it on the port side after they had gone past the problem. Who's going to tell them that? Now, this is a McPherson photograph. Now, I want you to look closely at the turret, and you can see that those two 11-inch doldrums are facing forward. But if you look at it to the side, you'll see two more gun ports. Well, could the guns switch inside? No. That's why the turret rotated. They painted fake gun ports to scare snipers away. And it worked. <coughs> this is what the Russians later would call maskarovka. It's a kind of masking. Great idea. Okay, so now we've got to have these tin clads. Admiral Porter had a special. Before the war, the Black Hawk was a Mississippi River Valley cruise ship. And Porter liked her color scheme, so he kept her at black and white. So everybody would know that it was him. And this is what's called a large tin player. Now, it had some amenities. The cabins had mahogany walls. He kept the very best bedding. And in the rear of it, there's a ramp. He had two pet horses that he would ride. And he had a barn in it. He had a great time. Now, can you imagine Admiral Farragut doing this? I don't see that. Porter in a heartbeat. She burned accidentally right at the end of the war. Love to see her. Love to see her. And she could carry as many, really, as 11 guns, big guns, if he wanted to. But really, he just used it for cruising. Keep an eye on the fleet. This is more like a tin clad. This is a famous one. This is a Covington. Uh, Ironclads could tell each other from colored stripes at the top of the chimneys. Tin clads could tell each other because the vessel number was at the pilot house. So this is absolutely without a doubt the Covington. The Covington and her near sister uh, will both be sunk one afternoon near the mouth of the Red River four determined Confederate guns, Porter says in his official reports, the rebels had 20 guns, our vessels had no trouble. No, they had four guns, and they knew how to move from one side of the start of the bend of the river to the other. And they were just, they killed six vessels in one hour. This is the uh, Washita. It's the size of the Black Hawk. Uh, it had a deeper draft and couldn't really get into places that the others could, but very powerful town defense. Very powerful. This is the Forest Rose, number nine. Forest Rose 
a lot of times you'll see this misidentified, but whoever is writing has no clue what they're doing. I don't mind saying that. Well, I proved it wrong. Because I found the uh, number list of all the vessels that uh, I applied. It's building Bailey's Dam on the Red River, spring of 64. It's pushing barges of debris to build a large dam across the Red River. The Confederates had blown up uh, a dam of their own making far upstream and diverted three quarters of the water from the Red River into a smaller stream called Bayou Pierre. And Porter had no clue that they died. Again, why it was happening. This is an effort to bring the level of the river up so that we could Refloat the iron clads, the tin clads. This is a cricket. This is Admiral Porter's flagship up Red River. Notice it looks different from the others. It looks a lot like uh, Fort Hyman and, and some of the others. It's painted gray. And that's very, very unusual. She was a porcupine. The Confederates cut her up and she stayed there. This is the signal. This is the sister of the Covington. Both of them went down one afternoon in May in 1864. Uh, they never had a chance. They were coming around a bend in the river, and the Confederates had perfectly set up their guns, their four guns. And uh, they went for the wheels, and then they went for the superstructure, and then they compressed them, just like you would skip stones across the pond. They aim just below it and hit the good water line, and both vessels burn. Uh, if any of you had relatives on 120th Ohio, if they weren't captured, they were killed or outright killed by gunfire or burn. This is the Fort Hyman. This is a uh, prototypical tin clad. Uh, this is a Fort Hyman. short. They were so happy with it. The bottom is painted black in that superstructure. Unlike ours, it's painted black. It was painted white. This is on Red River. You can see it's on a mud flat. This is above Bailey's Dam. This is in mid Bay, 1864, and she's waiting with her sisters to go. This is the Mississippi Squadron. Admiral Porter, when he was made admiral, says, just like Foote had said, can't be a flag officer. Right now, I'm the equivalent of a colonel. I need to be an admiral so I can be on a par with major generals. And so they made him an acting rear admiral when he became a rear Does anybody know why they call him rear admirals? Or vice admirals? Or full admirals? See in World War II. The British had this and had it for a long time, uh, even during the Napoleonic Wars, when you had long, long streams of, of British men of war. It required three admirals to control what was going on. You couldn't see the flags, the signal flags, so far out. And so the guy in the front is an admiral. And the guy in the middle is a vice admiral. And the guy at the rear was a rear admiral. That's as hard as it gets, folks. We didn't need any vice admirals. We didn't need any full admirals. We barely needed rear admirals. So they said, well, that's what we're going to do. Congratulations. David Glasgow Farragut was the first full admiral. His brother, David Dixon Porter, was the second. This is the fleet uh, at Cairo. Now, more books than not show it as the fleet at Memphis. If you've ever been to Memphis, try to find a, a ridge like that. It doesn't exist. That's just poor scholarship. They are inside the Ohio, facing upstream, and that wide area behind them is the convergence of the Ohio and the Mississippi. 
and there are several cooked turtles. There are several uh, large tin clads, several small tin clads, and not a few transplants. This is this is a grand image. This is at the end of the war, um, with almost all of the threat from the Confederate Navy being put aside. The, the Union then started to come up with something that it was come out. Let's put some big guns on them, but let's do what the Ellens thought. Let's make them go fast. So this is ram. This is a hell of a ram. Um, this is at Vicksburg, shot from the Louisiana side. There's some photographs of her from the front. Uh, Vindicator was all iron with an iron hull. And she was like a dragster. Don't ask her to turn corners. But if you got a straightaway, she'll be anything anybody can put against her. She'll even beat men on horseback on the land. But you got to stop sometime. And occasionally they didn't. Oops. But a fine looking vessel. Uh, she looks like a long, skinny diamond if you look at her from above. So the Confederates, of course, build their own, and we don't have time. We're not going to do the Confederate side next time. Um, they had to come up with, with sneaky ways. Tim talked about it this morning. You know, unconventional ways. And outside, there is a very, very fine model of what I'm going to show you. This is a Singer torpedo. Now remember, torpedoes are mines. They have no propulsion. They float there. And a lot, unlike what we said this morning, they, were, they could be very devastating. And you can see that with the Tecumseh. Particularly in the Mississippi Basin, they were devastating. And there, was, there were half a dozen companies that built these. But, um, the one on the bottom, well actually both of them are similar design. The one on the bottom is at West Point, weirdly. And it's built by the Singer Submarine Corporation, who also built the Hunley. And in Shreveport, five sister submarines. We've been looking for them. I can tell you where they are not. Singer Submarine Corporation. After the war, believe it or not, there was not a huge interest in hand crank submarines. So the Singer brothers got together and decided, let's do what every lady wants. Sewing machines. Singers. They were interesting folks. Again, another story. So what happens? Well, Union industrial capacity far outpaced the Confederates. My friend Richard McMurray has a great line. I've said that in some of his classes, he said it on some of mine. And somebody will inevitably say two things. First, when did the South lose the war? And his his fastest answer is when they fired up Fort Sumter. I agree. But the second thing that he likes to say is that at no point did the South have an opportunity to do a north knockout blow on the North, but the North had every opportunity to do a knockout blow on the South. I agree. And then he came up with, you know, his usual stuff. Uh, John Marjolak is another great Civil War historian taught at Mississippi State. And uh, we were all sitting at a symposium, we were on a panel together. And Marjolak is the U.S. Grant historian. He, he has the Grant Papers, Grant Foundation. And Marjolak says, I know one of the South laws in the Civil War. They were worth a damn and played the way back. They're great pump. But they couldn't handle it away. This is 
an engraving of Porter's fleet at Vicksburg on the night of, I believe, May 16th, when they ran the gauntlet. Uh, this is from a courier knives. You can identify specific ships. If you look at the one that's going the wrong way, perpendicular, that's the Lafayette. Had a little steering problem. In front of it is the Benton, and that what had uh, General Sherman aboard. But you see how high those bluffs are? That's not an exaggeration. The bluffs at Shreveport rise to 290 feet. The Navy could not elevate their guns even a quarter of that from midstream. And the Confederates could hit plunging fire. That's why they sank the Lancaster and the Switzerland. That's why they damaged a lot of vessels. But in this run, there was only one vessel that was hit. And it was called, oddly enough, the Flying Cloud. <laughs> whose captain decided that this was too much for him, and he tried to turn out of it, and every Confederate gun, instead of going for the ironclads, went to him and set him on fire. And all the signals from the other vessels was, let him burn. He's yellow. Nor one, because they couldn't wait. That's it. You're hearing this from the sun. <laughs> but it's true. Absolutely true. So, questions? Yes. Admiral Porter had it done. That's one of my favorite stories. Uh, Porter was worried about his gunboats getting clobbered or running the gauntlet. And so, uh, and I have seen this receipt. He brought in his chief carpenter and he says, let's make up something that will scare the fire out of them. He didn't say that, but he said it. And so they got an empty coal barge and a bunch of canvas. And they got some uh, barrels and they cut the bottoms out of them. And they built a reasonable, from a distance, good looking black iron plant. And on the canvas, they painted a sculling cross -pose. And then under it, in beautiful large letters, deluded people came in. And then they just launched it. And they let the river current move it. And indeed it did. And the Confederate gunners on the bluff were going, they have got some new kind of armor. We can't see where our shells are going. There's no sparks. It seems to pass through it as if it were air. Well, it passed through it as if it were canvas because it was. They put two sludge pots in the bottom of it and to make really black smoke. They said, well, it's a steamer. You can see that. The black smoke's coming out of it. It's a coal burner. And they fired at it with everything from muzzle loaders to siege guns, and it went right past. Them. And there are letters, there are reports, there's all kinds of comments where these gunners are admonishing their men at being such lousy shots. Three miles below Warrington on the south side of the Vicksburg defenses, it came ashore. Confederate cavalry went up to it and reported back quickly that this is just a humbug. Yes, sir? You know why the is that I do. Oh, you want me to tell you? <laughs> well, Eads wanted to name the seven poop turtles of the seven city class uh, vessels, and they're not ships, they're boats now. It's brown water. Gun boats, not gun ships. Those are aircraft. Uh, and he's from St. Louis, and he wanted it to, you know, Carondelet, or Carondelet, take your pick, is on the south side of St. Louis, still there inside the city. And um, he wanted it to be St. Louis. Well, they got it out there, 
It's the first one done. The newspapers are talking about it. It's got its guns. It's serving on the fleet. And then somebody, some, you know, poo head, definitely term poo head, in Washington says, it cannot be St. Louis. We already have a St. Louis. It's on the Naval Register. And so, Eads, uh, and a lot of other people, because there were some heavy hitters and still are in St. Louis, we want it named after the city. So there's no protocol for it. You cannot have two vessels on the registry active. And so they decided to change it to the Baron of Cal, who was a great uh, Revolutionary War captain. So, yes? Go for it. Most of them. Most of the ships that went down and uh, were either sank or scuttled. We know exactly where they are. We can't get to them or there's not enough money to bring them up. We know where Baron Decal is underground, under a bean field, but it's too close to the Azu River, and when you try to, to work on it, it floods up. The East Port was hit by a mine. It also on the Red River, and it's near in Grant Parish, came about during reconstruction, not during the war. Uh, it is very close to the river. I worked on that. And uh, it was a, a black water dive. You can't see six inches in front of your face. It's, it's, it's murky black. So the divers had to feel around. And they, they had much like a lead line. And they, they knew their, their uh, knots every foot. And they drew beautiful examples of it for ecology. Uh, the Navy said it was never deactivated, and so it is still on the U.S. Naval list, just as is on our sites. And so there is a federal judge who's trying to get the Navy to cough it up. And he wants to raise it, turn it into a museum. The problem is that Admiral Porter tried to blow it up, and there's another vessel on top of it that hit it. Uh, and in uh, our archaeological work, we brought up uh, barrel staves that still had ink on them that said uh, biscuits. Biscuits are gone, but barrels are there. Uh, four inch pork ribs, thousands and thousands of them. So, you know, they're there. Um, eventually, hopefully one day, we'll be able to get them up, look at them, but the money's not there to pay. Oddly enough, people that rather have highways and stuff like that. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. Yes. And that's on my next trip. I like the Ellens. You know, if they'd been around in the 20s, they would have been comic books about them. But what happened? They're just so far beyond the pale. You had a question. One of you. Okay. That comes from Eads, who, who said, I want to um, pay homage to all the Ohio and city and Mississippi River communities that helped. And so it's every place he had a yard, a rolling mill, a lumber yard. Uh, most of the kills were laid in Carondelet or in St. Louis. Four of them were built at Mound City, rolling, uh, Iron, the coils, came from Pittsburgh. I thought it was a great gesture. Yeah. Each was a good man. He's, he's one of my favorite people. I live long enough to do it, I'll do a body There's only two that I made. Well, thank you.